Well, good morning. Thank you so much for being here, and welcome to our first parent coffee and conversation of the school year. I'm Rachel Mapani, and I'm delighted to serve as the Lower School Pods President. Before we get started, I'm going to invite President Keith Evans up to the podium to say a few words. Thank you, and good morning. Good to see you all out this morning. Appreciate everyone coming out. I'm uh, I'm actually on loan from a board finance committee meeting here this morning, and so uh, you're, you'll have to forgive me for a little bit of talk and run, but uh, I'm going to go back and make sure that the Westminster ship of state stays right down the middle of the lane uh, here this morning. But I did want to take a time out and just come and both welcome you to a new school year and tell you a little bit about what we're up to. Some of this news is super fresh for me because five minutes ago I was sitting in a big conversation about construction and all these kind of things. And so I thought I might give you just a quick little synopsis of uh, what is happening with all these dump trucks and holes that we're digging and all those kinds of things, even while you all have some more kind of temporal uh, topics on your agenda here this morning that relate more directly to what's happening today in the lower school. As many of you know, we are in the process of a complete gut renovation of Campbell uh, Hall, which is one of our primary uh, upper school academic buildings. And uh, right now it is nothing but a shell. It's just bricks and walls. There's nothing inside. There's an addition being, on, being built on the back of that and then a plaza behind that and some new uh, seating plan for the stadium. The concept in all of this is really uh, one integrated space that does several things for us. It provides uh, new academic space for our upper school, much needed academic space as our upper school has progressed way beyond sort of a, what is the classic uh, kind of double loaded corridor with relatively small classrooms and chairs lined up in rows, uh, really to teaching and learning that's much more engaging, much more flexible, that requires a whole different context and setting, and so that is exactly the setting that we are building. Uh, I had the occasion to walk a prospective donor uh, through the building back when it was still intact, and uh, taken to this fairly risky strategy of walking in and asking students and faculty without any preparation, tell me what you think about this building. And uh, they are actually the best salespeople in the fundraising business, because they, <laughs> they, they like tell you honestly, you know, about the building. But one of the things, just to be very, very practical, that one of the one of the teachers noted, we walked in his classroom, kind of had wall-to-wall -wall chairs, everything was, was sort of very compact and, and fairly inflexible. And he said, you know, one of the things that I would love to be able to do is have my, my students teach each other that that is actually one of the best ways for students to learn is to teach each other. But the problem I have in this space is that I can't arrange the furniture in such a way that they can get to the whiteboard to do that. That is about the most practical articulation of why you need a particular footprint of space in an engaged classroom, as opposed to the classroom that many of us grew up in where the teacher was simply going to deliver a set of notes for the day. You were going to take them down, walk out, memorize them, come back and spit them back on a test. That's not the world our kids are living in. It's not the world any of us are living in either. And so we're looking at uh, a much different kind of uh, teaching and learning uh, strategy that really requires a different kind of space. We're also looking at ways that our facilities can build a greater and stronger sense of community. And so what you'll see is this uh, Campbell uh, complex kind of comes on board is that it has dining space in it, kind of in a, a smaller sort of grab and go setting, has a lot of light, light-filled hallways, light-filled classrooms. It has uh, continuous indoor and outdoor spaces. And actually, for the first time in our campus's history, it truly connects the athletic program to the academic program to the main outdoor quad spaces. And so we're really excited about this uh, right here in the beginning and are finding a lot of excitement in the community for it. The project is on budget and on time. <coughs> Next August 1st, uh, it will be ready and we'll move into it and uh, everyone will be invited to the ribbon cutting and we'll uh, have a chance to, to see what all that looks like even as we then move up to the head of the quad and begin work on uh, the first phase of a two-phase uh, performing arts center that will give us both uh, a forward-facing front door space for our external functions, large gathering spaces for meetings like this one and others even larger than this that we might want to do, and some classroom and art spaces as well. So we're really excited about uh, moving directly into that in the next phase of construction. 
At that point, you may or may not take a breath. My preference is never to take a breath, but uh, we may or may not take a breath at that point. Behind the scenes of this construction, we put in a whole new energy system that's going to save 5 million gallons of, of water every year. Uh, it's going to power basically all of our buildings. Uh, we're putting in a parking deck, which seems to be the thing like everyone sort of goes, oh, well, a parking deck, that's the most exciting thing. But, uh, Putting in a parking deck that's going to net about uh, 220 spaces uh, for the campus, and it will be accessible to Love Hall as well as the middle and upper school, so it will provide relief all over the place for parking. Uh, just one note a little bit about the future. Uh, so far this fall, I think we've had a smooth beginning in traffic and parking and so forth, and we're all finding our way. That may not be true after January. So just know that the pain is going to be there, it's going to be short-lived, and then it's going to be great. So from January, just brace yourself. From January to May, uh, it's going to be a little more challenging, we're going to be a little more adaptive, we're going to get a little more flexible, and then uh, after May, the sun is going to come up on Westminster in a new way that it never, never has before. So all of this, I think, is important for you all as Love Hall parents. You know, looking forward, you, these facilities we will have lived in a little bit uh, by the time your kids get there, and we will be actually then dreaming up uh, and thinking and designing the next next uh, phase of those facilities. And so this is something that I really want want you to take an opportunity to to both read what's out there. There's a spot on our website about it. Uh, and also uh, certainly come to those opportunities for living cuttings and those kinds of things because your kids will largely define what happens in these uh, buildings. But I'm always also very conscious of, of encouraging all of us uh, as parents not to fast forward through uh, our kids' childhood. What's happening right now in Love Hall uh, is really some of the most exciting stuff that, uh, that I've seen in certainly my, my tenure in schools. Witt and his team are uh, providing leadership across the board in, in terms of developing leadership in our students. There's some really exciting things going on in the fifth grade, extending down into the other grades soon. New curricular uh, movements that I think are, are feeding into some of the things that we're imagining uh, in the upper school. And then today you're going to hear about how we're thinking about supporting uh, students even in a, in a more robust way. Uh, and we're constantly working and thinking about that as we go. So. Keep an eye on what's happening on the other side of campus. It's going to be there for your kids when, uh, when they get there. But treasure these moments and engage with what you're seeing here at Love Hall. It's really an exciting time to be here. We're really excited about uh, both what our veteran faculty and new faculty are bringing to this and what the, what the leadership of Love Hall has as the, the twinkles in their eyes for, uh, for what's in this future. With that, I'm going to go make sure that we're not in deficit, we're on schedule, <laughs> on time, and uh, I do thank you all for coming out this morning. We're really, really excited about the year ahead of us. So thank you, and I think I'm going to hand back to you, Rachel. Appreciate it. Thanks. Because we need to treasure this moment with Keith. Um, on this day, two legends were born. One was Michael Jordan. Yes. Right? And then someone else with a similar career trajectory. <laughs> President Keith Evans. So on the count of three, if you can join me singing happy birthday. <laughs> Much like January, the pain will be now. <laughs> One. They have to sing the whole oh, song. we have to sing the whole song. <laughs> <laughs> oh. One, two, three. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Keith. Happy birthday. Started, I wanted to make two quick announcements. Um, first, Shelby Lasker and Jackie Wallace are our clock co-chairs, and they have a table set up over here um, for you to visit with a display about CLOP. CLOP stands for Children's Literature Outreach Program, 
It's a long-standing volunteer opportunity for Westminster parents. Every Wednesday morning after drop-off, volunteers work and read with second graders from nearby Scott Elementary. It's an inner city school just beyond their back gates. It's an impactful opportunity and a great program. So please stop by their table at the end. Jackie Wallace is here and she'll be happy to answer any questions. Also, in light of our main talk today, titled, Would You Like Some Great With Those Hash Browns? Flake has provided us with a delicious breakfast. This morning is meant to be informal, so please feel free to get up at any time during any of the talks and get yourself some breakfast. And now I'd like to ask our Moms Prayer Group co-chairs, Ann Park Hopkins and Katie Goaty, to lead us in devotion. Thank you. Uh, good morning, I'm Katie Goaty, and this is Ann Park Hopkins, and we just wanted to just share a few words before we get started. Um, when we were asked uh, to speak this morning, we asked what the subject was, and we learned that it was about grit, and I got really excited. I love the concept of grit. Um, however, I didn't know previously what it was about. I, I hadn't read Angela Duckworth's uh, groundbreaking work until it came out. So, so I heard the concept grit, and I didn't really know a lot about it. This was you know, a decade ago or whatever. Um, and when I heard the term grit, what I thought grit was, was, you know, I thought about Navy SEALs and marathon runners and people who just persevered through blood, sweat, and tears, and they ate rocks for snacks and so that was available, you know, and I was like, that's what I thought it was. I, I come from a long line of military service, and I'm sure that that contributed to my idea of what grit was. Um, but then I became a therapist, and... I realized that my my idea was really narrow when it came to grit. Um, now, when I think about grit, I think about the single dad who drives four hours a day to two jobs to provide for his kids. Um, when I think about grit now, I think about the mom who's battling cancer and she's really nauseous and she can't pick her head off of her pillow. But every night she reads to those kids. That's what I think about. I think about the couple who's fighting for their marriage. Even though there's a ton of pain and some loss, that's what I think about now when I think about grit. Right? Because grit is not just about the physical. It's a really inspiring quality. But it's all about the state of our minds and the state of our hearts and what we choose to focus on. That's what establishes this deep sense of grit. Right? I want more of that. I want more of that for our kids. Um, you know, uh, Tommy Newberry, is, he's an Atlanta native. He's the author of this book called The 4-8 Principle. And in it, he talks a lot about how our thinking and our thoughts, the state of our minds, impact our emotions, and then ultimately, our actions. And in this book, he has this really fascinating quote that I triple underlined. And it says, what you persistently think eventually, but inevitably, crystallizes into the words you say and the things that you do. What you persistently think eventually, but inevitably, crystallizes into the words you say and the things you do. Now, of course, that, that's, not a, that's not a new concept. It's, a, it's, in fact, a really ancient concept. And um, Paul, in the book of Philippians, in the Bible, talks about it quite a bit. And so we, when we were talking about what we were going to share, we thought, well, gosh, you know, this, the 4-8 principle is based on Philippians 4-8, and it's a really rich chapter that talks about the impact and the power of our minds to transform our lives. And so I wanted Ann Park to share um, that. Some, some thoughts on that verse with y'all. Thank you. Um, so I, in, in looking at Philippians 4, 8, I, I love to look at all the different versions of the Bible and different translations. So I'm going to read you my favorite two of this verse. Uh, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, this is Philippians 4, 8. Whatever is true, whatever is honorable and worthy of respect, whatever is right and confirmed by God's word, whatever is pure and wholesome, whatever is lovely and brings peace, whatever is admirable and of good repute, if there is any excellent, if there is anything worthy of praise, 
Think continually on these things. Center your mind on them and implant them in your heart. And just to really uh, kind of reiterate here, a second version is summing it all up, friends. I'd say you'll do best by filling your minds and meditating on things true, noble, reputable, authentic, compelling, gracious. And I love this part. The best, not the worst. The beautiful, not the ugly. Things to praise, not to curse. And as Katie was saying, I mean, it's really what you focus your mind on. And there's a, you know, I've heard a, something from um, an, an ancient scholar say that it's like there's a, there's a um, fight going on in your brain at all times. And the, somebody asks him, you know, who wins? said, the one that I choose to focus my attention on the most. So um, that's, that's really what the Philippians 4-8 principle is. And now we'll bow our heads in prayer with me. Lord, thank you so much for this time together. Thank you that we attend a school where we can learn about and focus on the whole child and focus on things like grit and share biblical principles. Thank you for all these parents here today who really are interested in learning how to develop their full child and give their child the best. Thank you for um, all of the um, people that are going to speak today. Thank you for their wisdom. Thank you for their dedication. And Lord, just please open our eyes and our minds and our ears right now as only you can. Help us to hear the words of the speakers today and help us to distill out what we need to hear for ourselves and for our children. We know you have the power to help us focus on what is true and noble and reputable. What is what is right and what is and what is wonderful. Please help us to do that in your son's name. Amen. Thank you, ladies, for that wonderful devotional. Um, as I think about the beginning of the school year, I can think of just so many examples of just happy moments. Uh, you think about the students walking into the building each and every day, the smiles on their faces, uh, the things that they do with their teachers, and just the overall warmth in this building. Um, I'm thinking about some of the highlights over the last couple weeks, and I think about our community morning meetings, right, where we give out our Good Neighbor Awards. I'm not sure if your children have come home to talk with you about these awards that they get for following the four Bs with fidelity. I think about the fact that our lower school is leading the charge on composting, right, because even though our colors are green and white, we want to be green in practice as well. So we're making sure that the rest of the community is following what our youngest learners are doing. But perhaps my greatest highlight uh, over the last three weeks was being able to tell my own story of grit to a second grader. So, you know, our second graders ask a lot of questions. And uh, one day last week, I was invited to lunch and I sat down. I didn't get to eat a thing. Um, <laughs> the questions just kept coming and they were like, well, Mr. McKnight, um, how old are you? So, um, I always answer a question with a question, how old do you think I am? And the, the range was anywhere from about 21 to like 56. So I'll take the average and I, I guess that's where I am. But then one student asked me, they said, Mr. McKnight, how did you become principal? And I was like, wow, I haven't been asked that question in a very long time. And I said, you know, what's so funny is the first time I applied to become principal, I didn't get the job. And everyone at the table was like, <gasps> you know, um, and I told them that I was, you know, I was young at the time. I didn't have a lot of experience, but I had a lot of drive and I had a vision, uh, but it just wasn't my time yet. And they said, well, well, what did you do? And I said, well, I kept fighting for it. And I took them back to a story in 2005, which was my first year at Westminster. Um, I had just moved to Atlanta, born and raised in Brooklyn, New York. I didn't have a driver's license yet. I met my wife, uh, and she said, I love you, but I'm not going to chauffeur you around everywhere. <laughs> so she taught me how to drive, and I would do this thing where I would always drive to the place the day before so I didn't get lost the day of. And um, had never heard anything about Westminster except that it was a great school, had never seen the campus, but decided to drive to the campus the day before my interview. Um, it was daunting, right? I, I had never seen 
a secondary school that looked as large as my undergraduate campus. And I just kept thinking to myself, like, what did I get myself into? Um, so if I was nervous for the interview, I was doubly nervous having seen that campus. Well, I went for my interview on that day, and it was sort of the best experience ever. And I remember coming home to my wife and saying, not only do I want to teach at that school, I want to become principal one day. And that was in 2005. And so I just kind of held this vision of wanting to lead a group of inspired and wonderful students, uh, teachers here at Westminster, and thinking about the path and the trajectory that I needed to take in order to get there. And I thought, when I was 27, that that was going to be my time. And it wasn't my time. Um, but what I've learned is that your, your goals, your dreams exist on the other side of grit, right? Success lies on the other side of fear. Success lies on the other side of that challenge. And even though we try to be as positive for our students as possible, what we know to be true is that there are always going to be moments that are challenging, right? And even though those moments are temporary, if you don't have the tools to deal with them, they'll feel like they last forever. And so here at Westminster, we really want to give our teachers, you, our parents, and then of course our students the tools to be able to navigate those challenging times so that they too can see their goals that exist on the other side of those fears and on the other side of those challenges. Today we have a special treat. Um, we're going to have Anna Moore come up and introduce our wonderful speakers. I wanted Anna Moore to do that so that you could see her face. Um, grit though important, exists, in my opinion, within a system of wellness and well-being. It doesn't exist in and of itself. Um, and we have a fantastic leader in Anna Moore who's really building an arc of student support, care, and wellness here. Um, and I wanted to just come up, her to come up and speak with you for a little bit, introduce herself, and then, of course, introduce our wonderful speakers. Uh, Dr. Moore, if you please come on up. Good morning. Um, I was hoping to take a moment today and just share with you the overall perspective of how we consider student support at Westminster. We support students who are nurtured by challenge, these are your children, within the context of a community that's dedicated to behavior guided by integrity and a consciousness of the larger impact of their choices. I'm going to break that down in just a moment because it's pretty complicated and it's pretty awesome. Given that that's our, our mission, our intent is to fulfill all of that, there are a few things that really guide our thinking as student support on campus. We intend to be everywhere. And we intend to be proactive. So we don't think about supporting students after the crisis. We intend to be connected with students across all areas of their life at Westminster in a really proactive way. Grit has a lot to do with that. We are research driven, being a school, being people who liked being in school and chose to come back and work in a school, we like to read a good research paper. But more than that, because we are unique at Westminster. Our setting is unique, our students are unique, and so we take the research, but then we think very deeply about what does that mean? That lovely study done somewhere in Connecticut, or perhaps in Boston, or perhaps in Palo Alto. Well, what does that mean when you come to school here for our 200 acres and for our students? So we spend a lot of time in deep discussion across our teams talking about how to apply that work to our students. And we are deeply focused on student empowerment. We've got folks on campus who can handle a student with a panic attack, but what we really want to spend our time doing is talking to kids before the anxiety hits that threshold and helping them understand, learn to pay attention to their own body, pay attention to their own thoughts, pay attention to their own heart, and empower them to know. We have students with dyslexia. Let me tell you what, we've got seventh graders now who can walk into a classroom and say, hey, Mr. Cuthbert, I'm dyslexic. Let me tell you what that means. Right? That's a student who's empowered. That's a student who, once they get to college, is going to know how to navigate those complexities in a more independent fashion. <laughs> so these are our guiding principles as we set about to do the work we do. So I put up the same slide, but I've highlighted a couple things. Because herein lies some of the complexity for us. Our students, 
your children will rise to the occasion. We believe deeply their capacity is unlimited. These are children who will change this school. They will change our city, our country, our world. Westminster alumni are truly all over the globe doing mind-blowing things. They seek the challenge, and it feeds something in them, potentially. The challenge looks different for every kid. But we also care that they're kind. And our culture, our world, society, the news, social media is full of examples of people getting ahead, but they're doing it by stepping on the face of the person sitting next to them. And that's not who we are. So that intensifies the challenge here. And because we want to nourish who these children are intended to be, unlock them, their fullest potential, but do it in a way that they move with integrity and compassion. We're designing proactive student support resources that are calibrated to a challenging experience. And the other piece I'll share with you, you're going to hear from two of our greatest leaders in this work on campus. And a couple things I want to point out. The narrowly defined scope of student support is counselors, nurses, and learning strategists. So those three entities partner together across divisions. We meet regularly so that lower school is talking to middle school, is talking to upper school, so that we can try to create continuity of experience for your students. But the other thing is this. Every single person who works at Westminster is part of the student support team. And I mean every <coughs> single person. I got a phone call a couple weeks ago from someone who works in institutional advancement because they had been in the ladies' room when there was a student in there crying after difficult moment. And that was someone who's, you know, probably calling and doing fundraising or helping fill out ads for whatever. Saw a student in distress and knew exactly what to do. Had my cell phone called, let me know. We've had folks from IT reach out and say, hey, we're kind of concerned about this. So it's everyone who works here. But I am excited today to introduce you to Camille May, whom you likely already know, and Meredith Miller. Meredith um, is one of our upper school counselors, and Camille is the lower school counselor. And one of the things that tickled me most about this joint presentation today is, again, offering to you, in reality, this idea that we are connected. It is one school, and your students' experience from pre-first through 12th grade is going to be undergirded by this stream of study support, this foundation, um, and a whole lot of grit. Dr. Miller and Ms. Thank you, Anna, for um, your kind words and being our fearless leader um, of our small but mighty student support team. I'm Meredith Miller, upper school counselor, and um, just first want to thank you for coming this morning. I know it took some sacrifice and maybe a little chaos. Mornings can be chaotic sometimes. Um, so thank you for that, but on a larger scale, thank you for entrusting us with the care of your children. It is not something that we take lightly. We consider it um, a privilege of the highest sort, um, and we are going to care for your children in the best way that we know how. So this morning we're going to be talking a little bit, a bit about grit. Um, thank you so much for the grits and hash browns for breakfast. Um, that was a pleasant surprise this morning. Um, so I'm gonna, we're going to start with Camille here. Once again, thank you for having us. Um, when I started prepping for this presentation, uh, my mind immediately started going to all the times that I thought I was a group, right? Um, I thought about when I was seven and I gave up on piano. I think my mother wanted it too bad. Um, I gave up gymnastics when I was 12, some ankle things going on. Um, when I was in high school, I did take APs. Um, because I thought other kids had more fun in regular classes, so that's what I did. Um, thankfully, that was back when state school didn't make you take like seven of them to get in. Um, when I got to college, I started out as a computer science major. I got an F in the first computer science class, and that was that. Um, and I don't even want to go into my 20s. There's a lot of other, a lot of other junk in there. Um, I share all that to say, um, give yourself and your children some grace. I think our minds immediately think, like, oh, I'm not gritty, I can't pass this on to my kids. Um, I see examples every single day of where they're not really living up to what I think they should. And believe it or not, those pieces are already inside you. 
they're already inside me, they're already inside all of us. Um, we have seen glimpses and flashes of it. I think the society tells us to kind of point out our flaws and our negatives, um, but all the time we don't think about, kind of to Ms. Doty's point, all of the things we see around us that really add to this grit story. So I can share you examples of times I've been gritty. Um, I mean, uh, yeah, it's, <laughs> you know, but I want you to know it's there. Um, and what I want to talk to you a little bit about to get started is what grit actually is. And grit is kind of this marriage um, between passion and perseverance. A little bit later, I'm going to go into exactly what those two mean, because I think sometimes people get confused as to what these two mean. Um, but the idea is that we have this ultimate end goal, kind of what Mr. McKnight was saying. And it can be about a lot of different things and a lot of different facets of our lives. But it gives us something to really strive and aim toward. And it's about really staying the path, making progress, even when that progress seems slow, even when it halts, even when it seems like you're taking a step forward, but there's a lot of steps back, really giving it consistency of effort and interest. Um, and believe it or not, it's not just about talent. We see a lot of very talented people that kind of fall flat. And we, we see that and we say, man, that was such a waste of talent. Um, so we know that people are talented, and yes, that can contribute to success, but it doesn't necessarily guarantee great. And so I don't want you to think those two things are synonymous. Some people just seem to be naturally lucky, like they're in the right place at the right time. Once again, that can give you some incremental success, but the goal is we want to build this thing in ourselves and in our kids that gets this passion and perseverance thing right. Um, you're going to hear a lot about Angela Duckworth today in this presentation because she's kind of like the great guru and she's written books and done all these other things. But she's going to talk a lot about, um, in a video we're going to see shortly, just about how that's cultivated. And there are a lot of things around us that say we don't have what it takes, right? And so we have to be very careful about that and the messaging we receive. But she talks about there's some elements that kind of go into grit or gritty people. Um, one of them is kind of this idea of never giving up. It's kind of cliche, we understand that, but that kind of has to be there. Um, there's also this idea that you use failure as feedback, and failure tends to be a very like negative word, or I failed at something. But instead of taking that failure and saying, you know what, I'm just not good at this, why am I even trying it, let me move on to something else, using that to give you bits and pieces of information. And our kids can get those bits and pieces of information too when they have successes and when they also kind of hit those blips when they're at school or on the sports field to give them information about how to proceed next. Um, there's this idea that you have to love the chase as much as you love the capture, right? So everybody wants that high achieving goal, but are they gonna love all the steps that it's gonna take to get there? Um, when I was listening to Mr. McKnight, I realized, like, man, he said that in 2005, and he became principal in? 2013. That's a long runway, um, <laughs> when you think about it. So in hindsight, you look at that, and you said, man, it took me eight years to really achieve this goal. But that's kind of what grit is. It's being consistent and kind of having that end goal in mind and taking steps to get there. Um, you have to be able to say to yourself, um, that I'm resilient, that I can build on these things, that I can face adverse things and move forward. And, <clears throat> and so that's kind of where we're going to head with the presentation. Um, Meredith is gonna kind of go into the research one, just so you have that background, and so I'm gonna turn it over to her. But keep in your mind, passion, perseverance. Sure, also, just two additional things. One of the things that we think that's really important um, for you to come and devote your time this way this morning is we want you to walk out with a few things We want you to walk out with some concrete strategies first of all for helping to grow grit That's probably why most of you are here And then we also want to provide you with some information about the theory and the research behind it So you know why you want to grow grit also We don't want you to have the misperception that grit is everything grit is not everything and in fact How many of you have read Duckworth's grit book? Okay, so quite a few. If you haven't, I highly recommend it. It's a, it's a really digestible read and really interesting. Um, and I feel a little bit sorry for her because she's come under a lot of fire within the past five years or so once the, the more robust data started to come in about grit and, and people were going, but grit's not the only thing to success. And she says, I never said it was the only thing to success. So keep in mind that these are just two components. 
Um, so Duckworth's interest in grid was piqued when she was teaching seventh grade math. And like many teachers do, she saw this incongruence between achievement, ability, capability, competence, and then actual performance. And she saw it both directions. She saw an incongruence like the kids who looked like they had the scores who should be performing weren't necessarily performing. And then the kids who didn't necessarily have those scores seemed to be overachieving. And so it piqued her interest and she thought, what is it about, especially these kids who seem to be overachieving, what is it that propels them forward? And so she developed the grid scale, which we'll come back to in just a minute. But um, like Katie, she might have had ideas that this is like military grit. So she actually started with research um, for the US Military Academy, West Point. Um, and West Point, could that, anybody know a lot about West Point or admissions or, okay. So before my role here, I did college counseling for 14 years, so I probably know enough to be dangerous about this. Um, but admissions to West Point is, as you might not be surprised to learn, highly structured and very quantified. So they take different aspects of an applicant, like achievement, so that would be you know, scores, grades, um, they look at leadership, and that would be anything from positions or like Eagle Scout to I'm the president of this club in my school to leadership that's referenced by a teacher recommendation or a counselor recommendation, and there's a physical fitness test. So they assign points and scores to all these things, and a candidate or an applicant earns what's called a whole candidate score. So once they're accepted, then they have to go through this thing called Beast Barracks, which is about like it sounds. It is a seven week program in the summer that is absolutely grueling. It is It really pushes people to the brink of their physical and mental stamina. Um, and so Angela Duckworth said, hmm, I wonder if the people with the highest whole candidate scores most successfully completed Beast Barracks or didn't drop out. And what was compelling was that the whole candidate score had no correlation whatsoever to who completed the Beast Barracks. And so she did this research over a few years and then she thought, hmm, I wonder if this can be replicated in other areas. And so that's exactly what she did. She started looking at sales performance in the business world. She looked at Chicago public schools, which have notoriously the highest high school dropout rate, and which kids were actually graduating from high school. Um, she looked at Green Berets. She even looked at kids who participated in the Scripps National Spelling Bee. Um, where she found that the children who advanced further in the spelling bee were not smarter or better spellers. They studied longer, but they also studied in a different way, which we'll come back to. So this research has been going on for a little bit. And what she used for to collect all this research is the grit scale. Now you've got a copy of the grit scale with a pencil underneath your chair. Feel free to take the grit scale or not. It's totally up to you. And I don't want you to overthink the questions as you answer. I just want you to think, how do I compare? And I also don't want you to compare yourself to like your small circle, your coworkers, your friends, your family. I want you to think about, how do you think you compare to most people? To be honest. <laughs> so we'll give you a couple minutes just to do that. Oh. They're probably some up front. It all yeah, there are seats.
bottom, instructions for calculating your grid score. So you're going to add up the points for all the boxes you checked and divide by 10. There was no judgment if you want to pull out the calculator on your cell phone. <laughs> <laughs> no judgment. I would be one of those people, perhaps. So the maximum score on this scale is going to be a 5, which would be extremely gritty. And the lowest score would be a 1, which is not at all gritty. So now you're probably saying, okay, well, what does that mean? So here are our context for comparison. Compared to, so our sample size is about 16,000 American adults. And so if you score a 4.1, you are grittier than about 70% of adults in that sample size. Now, if you want, remember that we said that grit has two components, passion and pure perseverance. If you wanted to calculate the subscores for these, you for passion, you would add up the numbers for your odd numbered items and divide by five. That would give you your passion score. For your perseverance score, you would add up the even numbers, divide by five. There's no numbers. Sorry. If you started with number one, big one, yes. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> you have to be gritty to figure out the calculation. <laughs> so, most people, if their passion score is high, their perseverance score is also high. Also, most people's perseverance score is a wee bit higher than their passion score, and that just further supports this idea that they're not the same thing. They're not exactly the same thing. Any questions on the actual scale? There are multiple versions of the scale um, of varying lengths. I think we just used this one for, for sake of peace. Okay. So when we think about passion, um, for example, a lot of times when we think about passion, we think about something that we're obsessed about, that kind of keeps us up, gets our gears going. Um, I, I equate this to the one thing I think about, about an obsessive passion is uh, my cousins growing up in, they live in Rockdale County, New York, and during the era of new kids on the block. And <laughs> We would visit and you go to their room and it was the comforters, the posters, um, the dolls, and it was it was a little strange. Um, but guess what happened as soon as that fell out of favor? Everything comes down, we grow up, everything becomes new. So that's what we think about with obsessive type passion. And when we think about grit, that's not the passion that we're talking about at all. Because a lot of people have enthusiasm about things, especially early on, but the endurance is the thing that's great. And so when you think about passion as it relates to grit, you want to think about holding steady to a goal over time. That's showing passion for something. If something comes in quickly and it leaves quickly, that's kind of an infatuation or an obsession. And we all do those things. Our kids do those things. They hop on one activity and then they kind of fizzles out. Um, but we don't want that in terms of grit. What we want is that long, steady over time, I'm committed, I'm engaged, and I'm really thinking about this seriously. Um, I, you know, we equate this passion to, it can either be like a fireworks type thing, and when you think about a firework, there's a big, big boom, and then it really winds down and it fizzles out fast, and then it's gone. Um, but how we think about grit is we think about more like a compass. So when you think about this compass, and it's kind of a compass that has to be built by an individual. Um, you put the different pieces together, you figure out which direction you go, you figure out what items are going to go in that compass that will get you there, and then you hold steady and you follow the path. And that takes a lot longer than a firework just going off one time. And so we want to have the compass mindset, not the firework comp uh, mindset, and we want to hold steady to things over time. Um, when we think about perseverance, we're thinking about organizing our goals. And when we think about goals, goals look different for a five-year-old than they do for a 38-year-old. Um, but there is always this goal at the top. And that high-level goal is the one you want to be stubborn about. 
So if it's becoming principal, I'm going to that because that's real easy. You can do it out there. If you think about that high-level goal of being a principal of the school, that's the goal that you're stubborn about. Like nobody can really shake you off that platform. Now these other goals kind of down in here is where some of the fun can be if we give ourselves time and if we give our children flexibility. Um, so for example, the goals at the bottom, uh, believe it or not, you may think I have to be stuck to these goals. So if I make a goal, I have to stick to it and I can't change it. And that's not what we think about it at all. So our kind of motto is try, try, and if it doesn't work, try something different. Um, instead of trying and trying and trying and trying the same thing over and over again. Because what is that the definition of? Insanity, right? So if your children are trying to reach those mid-level and ultimately trying to get that high-level goal, and they're doing something that isn't working, it's okay to tweak down at the bottom. We actually encourage the tweaks because that shows them, like, is there another path to get to where I'm going that's more enjoyable, that's easier, that makes more sense? Um, and then we can kind of build as we go. Um, but that goal at the top is really what we want to set our sights on. And for a five-year-old, that might mean over the course of a week, right? Um, and it might be tying their shoelaces. Uh, but for me, it might be getting my licensure, and that might take me three years. And so thinking about those goals and how we achieve those goals and how those look different across the age span. Now, one thing I want to talk about passion and perseverance is because I think there's this piece that we ask high schoolers especially, um, you need to know your passion. Come on, spit it out, give it to me, what is it? Um, and that's hard. This is stuff that emerges over years. And I think our kids, what they instinctually do is they give us something because they think it's what we want to hear and what they, they think pleases us. But we want to give this process time to evolve. Um, I know I, I've heard before, and you guys may have heard before, like we're kind of like the gardeners, all of us that are investing in these kids' lives, and our goal is to kind of plant the soil around them, water it, keep it nourished, and kind of see what pops up and grows. Um, but I'm still growing. I don't know about the rest of you guys, but I, I still need some of that soil and that nourishment to figure out exactly where this is going. Um, so think about that when you think about your kids too that they need the right kind of soil and the right kind of environment to figure all this stuff out and to help facilitate this goal setting process. We are gonna watch a quick video from Angela Duckworth, uh, which is next, and you'll kind of get some insight. If you're not familiar with her work, who she is and kind of how she got to where she is now. I would also say, can I just pop in one more sure. thing? These goals on the bottom, um, these low-level goals, one of the things that's very practical that you can do as a parent is get comfortable with what we call goal disengagement for these low-level goals and not get frustrated or impatient when your child chooses to disengage or abandon a goal at this low level. Also because very few of your children probably have those top life-oriented goals at this point. Um, in fact, very few of my kids in the upper school have that too. So um, don't feel like they're behind at all. Yes. <laughs> all right. achievement and I think I did inherit that from him. When I was a classroom teacher I realized that there was a yawning gap between what kids could do and what they did do. And again the reverse engineering of greatness is so that all the kids that we know and love can become a little more great. Catherine Cox, Stanford University. She systematically poured over thousands of pages of diaries, primary biographical data, from 301 geniuses, asking the question that my father asked, what makes a genius? The tendency not to abandon tasks from mere changeability, not seeking something fresh because of novelty, not always looking for a change. That's what I mean by passion for what you do. Second, the tendency not to abandon tasks in the face of obstacles, <coughs> perseverance, tenacity, doggedness. And this brings me to the modern day study of grit. Grit is sustained 
passion and perseverance for especially long-term goals. I believe that there is such a thing as talent. Without actually doing something, you'll never develop skill. Skill is what happens when talent is multiplied by effort. You may have heard of the 10,000 hour rule. You will meet countless individuals who have done something for 10,000 hours and are still mediocre. <laughs> what makes the difference is not the quantity of practice so much as the quality of those 10,000 hours. I think most people start off like potential world-class performers. They know nothing, they learn. But at some point, they walk into work and they do the same thing on Wednesday that they did on Tuesday. And that is what keeps you on what I call the plateau of arrested development. Here's a third option. You can even miss the plateau of arrested development. You can drop out of what you do. What happens when human beings drop out of things, maybe you spoke a foreign language, maybe you played a musical instrument like I did, is that you lose that skill. Human skill is really use it or lose it. And what worries me is that some kids and some grown-ups keep dropping out of things and they're never on any red learning curve to excellence. Now I said quality mattered, but what exactly do I mean? There are really only four elements of the kind of practice that world-class achievers do. First, world-class experts have a very conscious intention in mind when they sit down to do something. It's extraordinarily precise. But if you went to work last week and you didn't know exactly what you were trying to get better at, my contention is that you were not doing deliberate practice. Second, 100% focus, full heart, full effort. The lesson is concentration, effort, focus. Third, feedback, data. You need to know, did I make the shot? Or did I not make the shot? How did that sound when I pulled the bow like this? What was my time on that lap? What happens is that feedback is typically negative. Here's what you didn't do that you wanted to do. And are you willing to do the fourth thing? The fourth thing that world-class experts do that is different from most of us is they truly listen to the feedback. They reflect, they make an adjustment, and they start the cycle all over again. So before we wrap up, let me finish this story about me and my dad. Little girl, South Jersey, told she's no genius, thinks about it for a moment, has to agree, grows up, and in 2013 is told by the MacArthur Foundation that actually she is a genius. <laughs> and here's what I really want to say. If genius means getting things in life effortlessly, automatically, because you've got some inborn gift that nobody else has, then my dad is right, I'm no genius. But if genius is working with all of your heart on something that you love, that's endlessly fascinating to you, then I would say, Dad, you are a genius, and so am I, and so can everyone be if they choose to be. Thank you so much. <laughs> it is, I have right, the, the brain is not right to It's not it. Okay, so here's the good news. Grit does grow. It is fluid. It is dynamic. You can have a role in growing the grit of your child. Know that grit grows from the outside in and from the inside out. Go back up here to present. Okay, so let's start with interest. Interest is simply intrinsically enjoying what you do. And interests have the capacity to grow into a passion. Now, here's the tricky part many of us did not grow up with the messaging of follow your passions. In fact, many of us might have grown up with the emphasis on surviving the real world and actually with the messaging that 
following your passion could lead, could be a breadcrumb trail into poverty and disappointment. Yes. Um, and that you might, right? And that you might not appreciate it in that moment, but there are things that will matter later in life. For example, may I just suggest that there are jobs that are both high income and high status. Um, so those sorts of messaging. And I certainly was one of those people who grew up with that messaging. Um, luckily, I chose to ignore it um, for me. Um, but I was one of those kids from the very first day of kindergarten. I knew I wanted to be an educator. I came home, I lined up all my dolls in a row, I drug the chalkboard, yes, chalkboard, out, and I started teaching my dolls. And I just knew that, that education was going to be my thing. It's kind of taken an, an interesting path in education, um, but that was a passion from a very early age. And I was always a school geek, have all the student loans to prove it, always did well in school, it was never that difficult for me. And so my senior year of high school, of course college admissions, during that time it was not quite the, the big show that it is today. Um, but I'll never forget the day my senior year um, when I came home from school and my dad called me downstairs and he said, you know, Meredith, I'm not really confident that you're smart enough to complete college and I'm sure not paying for your college for you to go and be a teacher. So you can go anywhere you want as long as you get the Hope Scholarship. I was in that first class of Hope Scholarship recipients. Um, and so that was a very pointed, explicit message. My dad was a financial analyst, my mom was a broadcaster, educator was not in their world. So one good place to start might be to think about the messaging that your child receives from not just you, but from all of those who surround your child. And sometimes maybe following your passion could be a breadcrumb trail, trail into poverty and disappointment, but not necessarily. And with interest, no one is going to stick with something and doggedly persevere on something that they're not interested in. So I would encourage you to think about that messaging. The other piece um, is know that before hard work comes play, especially for children your age. Before someone decides on a top level life orienting goal, they have to goof around a lot. They have to trigger and re-trigger interests over and over and over. And the most, all the research says that at the, in those beginning years, you know, novices aren't interested in becoming the best that they can. They're interested in an activity because it's usually fun for them. And so research says that the best mentors for developing that interest are warm and supportive and they make it fun, like a game. And that's how what, what Duckworth calls paragons of grit rise to the top as they started with play. So encourage your child to play and to goof around. Um, at this level too, they also need small wins and applause. And they need a lot of them. Yes, they need to practice. Yes, they might be able to hand, handle like a tincture of criticism or feedback. Um, but they need those small wins and they need applause. And so that is something that you as a parent can definitely give them. I'm keeping myself on track so that I won't, uh, so that I won't ramble here. Um, a degree of autonomy. So there's also lots of research suggesting that overbearing parents and teachers actually erode intrinsic motivation. Um, so giving your children a degree of autonomy in deciding what they like which may be incredibly different from what you have ever liked or what your partner has ever liked, um, those are gonna be important too because those have greater capacity to grow into passions later on. All right, practice. So Duckworth talked about deliberate practice. Um, of course, one type of perseverance is just the daily discipline of trying to get better at something that you did before. But she described this deliberate practice with starts with setting a stretch goal, giving 100% focus and concentration, seeking feedback, and then using that feedback to refine one's practice. So the grittiest kids in the research that she did identified deliberate practice as significantly more effortful and less enjoyable than regular practice. But the grittier kids said they had fun doing the deliberate practice more than the grittier the kids who were low on the grit scale. Um, so that deliberate practice is something that you can hone into and look for. 
in your children. Finally, there's purpose. Third, there's purpose. Um, and purpose is just this idea that what I do matters to more than me, that it matters to the world, that it's integrally connected to the well-being of other people. Now, no six-year-old has a concept for purpose. We get that. Um, but you can start by talking about how your passions have a purpose, perhaps, and how people in their lives, their passions, actually contribute to others. Because nobody is likely to stick with something um, that is only helping only themselves over time. Now, as young adults, they might, but over time, especially as we grow toward our 40s, it becomes more and more important that we are contributing to the world in some way and giving back, and those things begin to take seriously. And finally, there's hope. So hope is this rise to the occasion sort of perseverance. And we can cultivate hope. Hope actually defines the top three. So the hope of grit rests on the expectation that what I do now can improve my life and the lives of others in years to come. Um, so just connecting that hope with the purpose, the practice, and the interest are ways that you can help grow up that grit. So resilience, um, and many of you have heard the word resilience before, you know what it means, but it's kind of like that ability to kind of get over those adverse situations. Um, and resilience is not something that's extraordinary. So I don't want you to think like, oh, we don't have it, my kids don't have it. We all have it. Um, if you really think about the things that we have dealt with, overcome, hurdles we've jumped over, whether big or small, this is kind of a part of all of us. And so resilience is kind of divide, defined into these three buckets. So you think about challenge, commitment, and you also think about personal control. So challenge means that you're willing to take on difficult situations and you're really willing to take them on head on because you see challenges as something to grapple with and something that can be possibly fun. You also need a level of commitment. And so it's not just about doing work, it's about how committed you are to seeing it through and seeing those outcomes. And also, you think about worthy people, they don't focus on a whole lot of things that they don't have control over. And so that's hard for all of us, because, and especially parents, because we want to control the uncontrollable, our kids. Um, and so we think about what's in the realm of their control and what are things that they really need to focus their attention on. And if something is outside of our control, we really don't have time to focus our energies on those things. You know, we've heard about like focus and control and all those things, and that's what this is talking about. So challenge, commitment, and control. Um, we see examples of resilience all the time, and we think like, oh my goodness, there are parents that dealt with Sandy Hook. There are people in the Bahamas right now overcoming hurricanes. Um, there's all kinds of things that have happened in our culture, in our families. Our children have gone through family changes, they've gone through death, they've gone through different things that have seemed traumatic, and you know what? We're all still kind of standing and we're pushing forward. And so they have these genes within them, they're just kind of muscles that have to be flexed. So, so grit and parenting style, and Meredith touched on this a little bit. Um, but I think we can all look at our parents and we're all, they're all wonderful people. My parents were probably a little more permissive, which is probably why they didn't, I didn't know that I wanted to be a teacher and I would drag on the child board. I was more like, eh, let's take this as it comes and life is great and, um, you know, I went from, oh, I want to be a pediatrician, no, I want to be an engineer, no, I want, oh, computer science, I told you I failed that class. <laughs> and then I went through business and I started out my career at GE and then somehow I ended up being a school counselor, which is kind of more my wheelhouse. Um, but you kind of have to have like an authoritative um, parenting style to really instill that grit. And a lot of people hear authoritative and they think, oh my goodness, that's like boom, boom, boom. And there is some boom, boom, boom to it. Um, so there is a piece of it that's demanding, but there's also a piece of it that shows a lot of work and respect and nurturing. And so it's the balance of those two things. Because if it's, if it's lopsided in any one direction, you're not gonna get the outcomes that you want. And I think sometimes we are so concerned, I mean, I have a daughter and, you know, we we're so concerned on, on outcomes and making sure they're on the right track and they're hitting milestones 
And then God forbid you look at other people's children and you're like, oh my goodness, they're reading, they're four. And like, yeah. it's like, where am I going wrong as a parent? And it can lead you down this very, very slippery slope of comparison. Um, and believe it or not, um, the authoritative parent knows to kind of tune as much of that noise out as possible and really focus their energy. Parenting is a gritty process. And you have an end goal in mind. And the goal of that should be to produce this outcome, whether it's a teacher, whether it's a musician, whether it's an artist, whether it's a doctor, a lawyer, whatever it is, um, that has someone that has grit and they find their purpose to be fulfilled. Um, did you want to add anything to that? Well, just that young people thrive when they receive the message that we expect a lot of you and we're going to give you all the tools and the support and the cheerleading that you need to get to those things. Yeah. So it's a, it's not an either or, it's a yes and. And this kind of pulls at our strings, right? Because it does. I was watching um, um, something about a, a famous DJ and he was saying like, I know my parents when I told them I wanted to be a DJ, they were like, absolutely not in the back of their heads. Like, DJ, no, that it just sounds like, what did you call it? Uh, um, like a basement and video game trail career. Yes, yeah. trail into the poverty. Um, but now he's wildly successful and rich. And then I look at students that graduated from Westminster. We have famous makeup artists and people doing all these magnificent things. And I was just like, man, I bet their parents in the back of their mouth were like, oh my goodness. <laughs> You're going to do what? You don't want to do what? Yeah. But somehow we have to push past that and still try to figure out how to cultivate that. But also give them the discipline to say, if you're going to want to be a DJ, you better be the best DJ as possible. Because we're going to surround you with all the resources and exposure you need to fulfill that dream. That's hard. That's very hard. It's because we don't want our children living in our hands forever. Yes. Um, so we talked about perseverance and um, being intimately related a little bit to uh, fixed versus growth mindset. So this is an idea from Carol Dweck out of Stanford. Many of you probably heard of it. Um, and we will, by the way, we'll share all these slides on WPU so that you don't, you don't have to worry about them, capturing them all. Um, I know that one on the right is very difficult to read. Um, but the idea is such that um, with fixed mindset, you are born with a set limit of capabilities or competencies. So once you hit that limit, you've maxed out, you've tapped out. Whereas growth mindset frames the brain as a muscle and says every time you encounter something difficult, you stretch it, you grow it, it's like a workout for the brain. So here are just a few ways to help your child develop a growth mindset. First of all, talk about it with a spirit of inquiry rather than scolding. Sarah Blakely, the founder of Spanx, attributes much of her success. She, at the dinner table every night, her dad would ask her, what did you do that was difficult today? What did you learn from it? And that made it not such a taboo thing to talk about failure, which leads to the second thing. We actually want to encourage fa failure, I know. That is a really difficult thing to swallow. Um, but in fact, failure is a normal part of the learning process and of life. And I run into the struggle with upper school kids all the time where they fail to quiz. And I'm like, OK, so you'll do better on the next quiz. And they feel like it's the end of the world because they did not do well on this quiz. And I'm like, but that's a data point for you. That's a data point telling you where you need to go after I acknowledge and validate and get them calmed down. <laughs> and to that point, um, it kind of what we, I see in the lower school a lot is because they anticipate failure sometimes, it keeps them more into trouble. And so, and that's what we don't want is that they say, I don't think I can, so let me retreat. And we don't want to retreat. We don't want to pull out, we want to push in. Right? Because we will help them in those moments and they know that you guys are going to help them in those moments when they do have a sense of failure. So. And if you can talk about failure in a way that it isn't so taboo, number one, your kids won't be afraid to fail and number two, they won't be afraid to talk about it with you. Because I also encounter a lot of kids who are like, I'm not telling my mom about that quiz. Um, and so there's fear around that failure. Um, you want to praise the process and de-emphasize the outcome. So the process of learning itself is like messy and serendipitous and inefficient and recursive. And you want to make all those things okay. It's not necessarily just about the A's. Because I really want you to think carefully if at the end of the day, your child has amassed a lot of A's, but is not happy and doesn't contribute to society in a meaningful way and doesn't like to learn, then the A's aren't going to matter a whole lot at the end of the day, right? 
Um, I also want you to think personally about your moments when you experience the most growth. When you like had an epiphany or you're like, huh, there's something I might need to change here. Those usually arise from moments of discomfort, right? We don't grow a ton when we're super comfortable. So you don't want to rush in and rescue your child from those moments of discomfort, even though it's really, really difficult because you have the life experience and the wisdom and you can say, but I can protect you. I can prevent this from happening. Now, please do not misunderstand me. We're not sending any child in the street in a highly trafficked area to play and say, well, you gotta find out what happens. <laughs> if it is, if the risk, if the consequence is too severe or it's a safety concern, obviously you want to rush in to rescue. Um, but like, for example, in the upper school all the time, I run into families where they're like, well, my child said he wasn't prepared for the test, so I let him stay home. And so we kind of dig into like the messaging behind that. <laughs> we dig into the messaging behind that, but I'm telling you, I'm preparing you now, it's going to be tough as a parent because it's going to pull on your heartstrings and you're going to want to save your child from that discomfort. So kind of take your iron pill and get ready for that. Uh, we talked about framing the brain as a muscle. Every time you encounter difficult things, it's a workout for your brain and that's a good thing. So we want to embrace challenges. Um, and then help them change the dialogue. So one of my favorite things to say is yet. When a student says to me, I just can't do algebra, I'll say yet. <laughs> the power of yet, and just emphasizing that learning. Um, and if we can help them with the shift from, why is this happening to me, from a victim stance, to what is this trying to teach me? What is the learning potential of whatever I'm experiencing? Um, again, after we acknowledge and validate, because um, they're not going to be ready to go there right away. Uh, but those are all ways that we can help to inspire a growth mindset. And I think, too, to kind of add on to that is that um, we see all the time some of the most talented kids get outpaced by the kids that are willing just to be a little bit grittier and put in a little more effort. And I think as parents, we have to remember that, that it's okay to say to your child, like, yes, you may have been more talented in your mind, um, but the reward comes when you work hard. And so if somebody worked harder than you, talent or no talent, and they got the prize, that teaches you a lesson that next time you kind of put in a little bit more effort. And we don't want our talent to make us lazy. Okay, because talent, like I said, will get you success so far. And there are too many people in the world to think that our talent alone can surpass everybody out there. Eventually, someone comes along that's equally or more talented in that area and then we have to figure out how to kick it into gear. It's much easier to learn that lesson when you're young than to try to figure out, oh, hey, man, now I gotta actually, can't just rely on talent, I have to actually put forth some effort to get the things that I want. Um, so that moves us on to the hard thing. I know we're uh, getting short on time. So this is the task for your families. So um, Angela Duckworth said that all families should do this at some point, um, when developmentally appropriate. You know, if you have infants, try not to do this with them. <laughs> But everybody in the family needs to set a goal, right? They need to set a goal. Everybody has to be aware of everyone else's goals. Top to bottom, mom, dad, everyone else. And you have to commit to it. And you cannot quit that goal until the season that you committed to is over. So until that final student loan payment is done, until you <coughs> lost that pound that you wanted to lose, whatever it is, you have to stick to it. Um, and then you have to allow your child to choose their own goals. Because it's easy to say, you know what, you really need to work on that cello. So let's go ahead and stick that cello as your goal. The kid's like, fine, I wasn't interested in it anyway, but I you say so. But everybody has to choose a goal that's important to them. And then we have to model it, we have to talk about it, we have to gauge each other's progress, we have to encourage one another, that warmth, support, but then we have to demand a lot of one um, and I think they will start to see because they want to emulate us. And teachers, everybody, the adults around them can engage in this process too of showing them that grittiness is within all of us and it's hard for all of us. So if you guys can work on this, think about it with your families, um, we think it's a great way to encourage this kind of attitude in your families. And it's a great way to support one another and to get communication flowing about things that are hard. So these are just the takeaways that we that we have referenced today. Um, put one front, foot in front of the other, hold fast to an interesting and purposeful goal, invest in challenging, deliberate practice, fall down seven times, and rise eight. Those are your takeaways. Um, we also 
I just like to do this for my parent education presentation. Um, so I like for you guys to walk out with something very concrete. Um, so these are lots of ways to promote grit. Um, and so we're, I'm going to put them on this chair over here. Grab one if, as you'd like. Um, maybe one per family if we could, just to make sure there are enough. Um, and just thank you for your time this morning. I know we got rushed at the end. Uh, we will stick around for questions or anything like that that you might have. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for having me. Thank you for having me.